and welcome to episode 92 of the Power Score LSAT podcast. I'm Dave Kalorn in Napa Valley. And this is John Dinning in Los Angeles. How is Los Angeles today, John? I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't know. You and I have both been so busy, I, I forget there even isn't outdoors. <laughs> well, outside my house, it's 95 degrees, so it's warm here. It might be 95 here, it might be 52. I, I don't have a clue. You're in temperature-controlled environments, so you don't have to worry about it. I'm more just in a cave of work overload, but yeah. It's, yeah, you uh, need both. I'll see the outdoors this weekend, maybe. Not me. I'm going to hang out and work some more. Well, good luck with that. Um, <laughs> no obviously, yeah, it. obviously a, a big part of what you and I are both referring to is that we're still in a bit of the fallout zone from the August LSAT that we just had last week, really. But people even today as we're recording this, are still testing makeup people. Yeah, and we will talk about that momentarily. So mm -hmm. if you were one of those people who have finished your exam, uh, we'll get the opportunity to kind of get a review from us as to what was on that test very briefly. Because that's not the focus of the episode today. The focus of the episode today is we're taking student questions, and we have a boatload of them. We really do. Uh, yeah. So obviously, if we're going to take student questions or really just do anything whatsoever, we're going to have a drink. So, John, what are you drinking tonight? Yes. Um, well, this will, I think, be indicative of how I'm feeling. I needed caffeine, so I made an espresso martini. Well, that's so cute. And I'll be honest with you, it's not very good. <laughs> this is not my forte. <laughs> well, you made it, and that's really what counts. Yeah. I, I have hope that the second and the third and the fourth will progressively improve. They always do, don't they? Well, if they don't, you tend to just care less. <laughs> That's the nature of drinking. That's it right. always gets better until suddenly it doesn't. Until it, yeah, until you turn that corner. What are you having? I have a drink that is essentially the same color as yours. This is a Colorado Bulldog, which okay. is really just a fancy name for a white Russian. And then you put like an ounce or two of Coke in there. And that all of a sudden gives a little bit of a different uh, flavor to it. But I like white Russians. That's my go-to drink in life. And so <laughs> this is really very close to home for me. And pretty much the same color as an espresso martini. Yeah, that probably is like your last dinner cocktail. Oh, yeah. If I was on death row for some reason, uh, this is precisely what I would order as my final drink. This is how you go out. Well done, a lot yeah. of alcohol. It's nice and easy, smooth to drink, no acid, nothing like this whiskey stuff that you like to drink. Yeah. So I'm drinking for caffeine and Dave's drinking with death row in mind. I think that's a pretty <laughs> clear indication of how we're both doing at the moment. Smooth flavor is what's on my mind. The sweet release of death. John, what is the song of the week? Oh, yeah. Well, I probably shouldn't joke so much about death just then, huh? Because no. we, we have picked a Rolling Stones song. Uh, in honor of their recently deceased drummer, Charlie Watts. So RIP Charlie, he made it to 80 against all medical um, predictions, I assume. And we picked a song. Yeah, I mean, those dudes lived hard, man. Yeah, but I think that Keith Richards lived harder than I think almost any human. I think Charlie was a little bit more reserved. Well, compared was to Keith, Keith yeah. level kind of partying. That's true. The Bonham style. Uh, but yeah, all those guys have been doing this for, you figure, 55 years, probably at least 60 years. It's a rough life, man. He was always the guy you see in the pictures who looked older than everybody else, but was dressed in this very dapper, almost jazzy style. Yes, yeah, he got older, they still dressed like, you know, the frilly 60s collars and stuff. <laughs> and he slowly morphed into a country club dad or something. Exactly. See him in a pop but... collar and a blazer. What's the song choice? I love this song. This might be my favorite Stone song. It's called Gimme Shelter. Yeah. This is my second favorite song after Sympathy for the Devil, but we've already used that on this podcast, and sure so did. we knew we couldn't reuse it, even though it's probably one of the few songs that's worth double usage. Yeah, I wouldn't have minded a second time, but Gimme Shelter is great and fitting, I think, for today. What we're attempting to do here is really kind of welcome people into the umbrella of information. Ask us questions. We got you covered. 100%. I agree with that. So let's get some shelter out there for those February 12 retakers. Let's dive into the LSAT world. Today was the makeup exam for August testers who ran into initial problems a week and a half ago. John, what did they do? Yeah, pretty predictably here is they have done the classic old February LSAT reuse. Today, they have reused February 2012. 
to the test. We have seen this one get used a lot. So as soon as people started talking a little bit online about the content, straight away, I knew what test this was. Um, yeah. I'll give you some of the content, some of the other uses, and then we can talk a bit about the scale that we think people today would have. So yeah. quickly, for those of you wondering, uh, the reading comp, some of the passage topics, there was one on sandstorms. It was a passage about heirloom crops. In games, we saw a game on long and short television commercials. Uh, there was another game about five people going into three different apartments. And then logical reasoning, both original LRs on this test had 25 questions. I only saw that they used one of the sections today, though, as real. And this was a section about liming a lake, about fluoride in water, helping to prevent tooth decay. There was a question there about a Martian meteorite. So if you took it today and those sound familiar, that would be a real section of LR. Very nice. So this is also a test that you and I know pretty well because they keep reusing it and it's come up a whole lot of times over the years. Yeah, this is in fact the second time they've used it this year. The first time we saw it in 2021 was back in March as a makeup test for people then. So this is the second 2021 makeup. The biggest use, aside from the original in 2012, was probably last June. June 2020, this was one of the flex forms that people saw. So we have got a lot of information on this test and have gotten a lot of feedback on it. I feel very comfortable when talking about this test with people as to how it went. Yeah, this is an exam that we saw back in 2019 in March. It was the uh, European LSAT. Mm -hmm. They used it in January of 2019 as the Asia region LSAT. And notice That's how they right. flip flop those regions right there back to back because they are they give different tests in each area. They use it in September 2017 in Europe. This test has been used multiple times over the years. So it keeps coming up lots of times with very small test groups. Today's test group was probably what? A um, oh, couple hundred, couple hundred at the tops, very yeah. most. That's right. Yeah, so this is a situation where they can give it to a lot of small groups because even though they've used it in main administrations occasionally, Hopefully, none of those people ended up with it today. And if you did not have this test, it means that you must have taken one of those prior exams. So they gave you uh, a different exam. And we didn't hear any reports of that, but it wouldn't be a surprise if that occurred. Yeah, it's such a small group today that one or two outliers wouldn't make much noise, potentially. But for the vast majority, possibly everyone who tested today, that was the test they got. And I think the easiest way for us to discuss now what to expect with the scaling is just to refer to the June 2020 discussion that we've already had about this exact test form. Yeah, we covered this in podcast episode 58. So I already right. went through all these sections in a little more detail, talked a little bit more about the difficulty. So that's why we're not going to cover it here. However, just to save you the step of going back and listening <laughs> to that episode, which is an excellent one, I recall. All right, I don't know. It yeah, I don't remember is. either. I was impressed. <laughs> I don't remember what wow. we talked about in episode 58, aside from covering the content. What was the scale prediction we would have made for this exam? What we figured was that the combination of games and reading in this test would loosen the scale from our normal starting point of minus 7 to a minus 8. So you could miss 8 on this for a 170. And it was a 75-question form uses of this test. So again, 67 correct, I think, was the raw score we were expecting. We talked a little bit about LR, where one section was slightly easier than the other, but I still think both of those LR probably sit at zero. I don't think they're going to loosen it. So any optimists out there, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Anyone hoping for a nine, I don't think this test gets there. But I think eight is a very comfortable prediction. I'd be surprised by seven as well. All right. So about a minus eight on the scaling there. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking for more information, just head on back in the archives, go to episode 58, listen to that, and we'll go into it in a little bit more depth sure. in that episode. But on that note, let's move on from today's makeup information. Let's run through a couple of deadlines and dates that are actually coming up. Let's talk about some of the October and November deadlines. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've talked already a little bit about the October registration deadline being this week. In fact, it passed yesterday, the 25th. So if you missed that registration opportunity for October, sympathies, we are sorry. Um, but November would been, then be the next test you could take. If you're signed up for October and want to pull out of it, we actually have some interesting news on this that we're going to talk to right now, officially, until September 4th, you can still get a $50 refund if you don't want to take October. However, we have gotten some information like breaking news as we sat down to record this. 
that LSAC seems to be extending that October refund deadline until after the August score release. Again, anecdotal so far, LSAC hasn't made this announcement that I'm aware of, but people are talking about it. The August yeah. school release is Friday, the 10th of September. It sounds like, and you may have to petition for it, it sounds like you may be able to withdraw from October for a full refund, which would be amazing, by September 12th, so two days after that school release. I hope that's the case. That would be a really, I think, uh, generous but also fair thing to do for students right now. But this is so new, and I'm just in the, the news of it. Contact LSAC and see what they say. Yeah, this is anecdotal right now. We saw this pop up on uh, a forum and people were talking about that they'd made a complaint about it and then they got a call, of all mm -hmm. things, from LSAC. I've reached out to my LSAC contacts, actually a text in this particular instance, but it is later on in the day here on the West Coast and uh, my contacts are on the West Coast as well. And so I haven't heard anything mm -hmm. yet, but perhaps I will. If I do find confirmation on that, I'll post that on my Twitter account, which is just at Dave Kaloran, and uh, hopefully I'll have that response confirmed by tomorrow, whether or not it's just uh, f something universal for everybody, or whether it's localized to people who make uh, uh, complaints about it or have some kind of particular situation. We'll know more later, but it is right now in the offing as a possibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to be continued. Indeed. And as you mentioned, John, that August score releases on Friday, September 10th. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, you know, we're talking about the possibility of an October refund deadline being extended <laughs> on the following Sunday from that score release on September 12th at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. John, it seems like it's way too soon, but we're doing another crystal ball for the October and November LSAT. I know. I feel like we just logged out of the last one and here we go again. Um, the good news about this, uh, despite the fact that you know, they're a lot of fun. But I think we have some new things to say, given what we've learned now from August. That's always a good thing, because we wouldn't do it if we didn't feel like we could say something that uh, kind of gave new dimensions. And we felt maybe throughout this fall run, the chances were good that we would be able to add kind of like new value to what we were talking about, but we weren't certain. It's turning out that we think that we can. So that is something that you can sign up for free. You can go to our website, powerscore.com, and go to forward slash free seminars, all is one word. And then you can sign up there. It won't cost you anything. And uh, then you'll be able to log in when we actually do that live on sub Sunday, September 12th, and listen to what we have to say about it. Like all the recent Crystal Ball webinars, that is going to be live to the public for free that one night only. I always want to say that <laughs> in Cleveland. There will not be a second showing. And then thereafter, we will take it down and it will not be sent out to students. Uh, unless you are a PowerScore student, then we'll be in your online student center. So that's just something that we've agreed to do and it's working so far. So we're going to continue doing that and we're happy that we're still able to have these kinds of discussions before the test actually shows up. Yeah, like I said, they've been a lot of fun and they've been really well received. I think largely because we're accurate when we do these things. If we go in there and really blow it with one, we'll hear from, from folks. So I don't far, think so the good. nature, the nature of the test and what's happening, it means it will never be too far off because there are a core set of ideas that are always going to be tested, and we have, you know, we know what those core ideas are, so we talk about those. We do change it. Um, we made a big change to this last one we did in terms of like the way we presented information and what to actually look for and what to study as well. So we'll probably change that up just a little bit. But uh, overall, I don't know we're ever going to be completely off base with something like this. It's just not the nature of the LSAT. It is a standardized test, and that means that things are going to come up over and over again. Yeah, I think worst case, we'd just be hitting singles and doubles um, as opposed to the grand slam that we had prior to the June <laughs> test. Yes, indeed. Hit it out of the park. <laughs> uh, somebody, uh, one of the Minnesota Twins players hit uh, a ball out of Fenway. Uh, yesterday, which does not happen very often. It was one of the longer hits in the history of Fenway, and I was <laughs> reading about that. That's what we hit in June. But that doesn't always happen. <laughs> yeah, straight out to the parking lot. Um, I'll, I'll make note, too, that while you're on the free seminars page to get signed up for the Crystal Ball, poke around, click on everything, go absolutely nuts. We have a ton of free seminars coming up. 
uh, including one that I love on admissions and admissions 101, I think September 1st. And that is going to be a particularly relevant one to a lot of the questions that we're going to answer here today, too. So, exactly. So let's dive season. into the student questions then. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, we haven't done one of these in a while, as I mentioned. We, this is our seventh one, but we're 25 or so episodes, 20 episodes removed from the last one. So what happens when we take some time away from this is the questions pile up, <laughs> as people will see. There's a lot to get through. Let's start with kind of categorically looking at some test prep or some studying questions. Yeah, and I'll point out that the questions largely, you know, we often try to answer them in an ongoing fashion or mm -hmm. people post them in our forum and stuff. A lot of these questions we asked for, we said, hey, what do you have out there? And in the last couple of days, people sent us a bunch. Yeah. So for all of you who uh, interacted with us and posted questions, thank you. That is super appreciated. And uh, we're going to try to answer all the questions that we were sent uh, that um, we think we can cover here. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good point. John. Quite literally couldn't do it without you. Um, <laughs> two Very questions, true. yeah, two questions came in via email that were so similar to one another. I think we just need to address them um, as a collective or simultaneously. You want me to read these two and then we can talk through them? Yeah, because I haven't seen them yet since I've been so busy today. <laughs> I know. This is, we <laughs> so did this be... once with an admissions one where it felt more like an interview day format as opposed to a... <laughs> oh, we got, we're coming to admissions soon, so I'm sure it's going <laughs> to turn the tide a little bit. Okay. But... Uh, Go ahead and hit this first one. All right. Um, and we'll try to keep any specific details to a minimum here. We don't want to like out anybody. So here's the, the comment or question that came in. I'm 39. I have two businesses that I run and I work a full-time job. Eesh. I also have three kids and I'm really struggling trying to not only focus on studying, but even finding time. It's a priority for me. I'm making changes in my schedule to do this and to be a success. However, I'd love to know a strategy for studying while on the go and moreover, studying when I'm not 20 and have a really busy life. <laughs> so how do you manage your time? How do you make the most of your studying, get the most bang for your buck there? Let me read the second question that I thought was in the same vein. And then we can talk through this. So similarly, email. I'm in an area of law as a paralegal where the work is very demanding and trials will start soon. I'm currently a student taking an online course with Jeremy P. That's one of our instructors, one of my favorites. He's great, by the way students. Of. I'm struggling with balancing my full-time job and studying for the LSAT. I plan to take the November 2021 test. Any tips on how to handle this? So two very busy individuals on slightly different paths here, but asking basically the same question. Yeah, this is, I've got a busy life, you know, a normal life mm -hmm. uh, in terms of work and in the former case, three kids. So, uh, wow. I have one child and that's hard to keep up with. And I don't even feel like I'm doing you know, the primary care. I can't even imagine three kids. Uh, hopefully one of them at least is older and can help with the, uh, the two others. Yeah, seriously. I appreciate Here's you not counting me as your second child in that little <laughs> field. At least not publicly. I was waiting for it. <laughs> <laughs> Privately, yeah. yeah. Um, here's the first thing I'm going to say, which may not seem like advice at all, but I'm going to say, don't pressure yourself. Realize that you have to have a work life study balance. If you're unhappy in your personal life or you're struggling at work, you, you're studying and the quality of time that you spend is not going to be great. You're going to always feel like you're behind the eight ball. And so I realize that these questions are about what do I do? But the first thing I would say is adjust the mindset that you have towards this to realize that you can make all these changes and you can kind of like start carving out time. But at, at the same moment, you have to not overly pressure yourself if something slips through the cracks. If all of a sudden one of your children needs your time or the trial kicks in and you need an extra hour, take care of your priorities. That will ultimately provide you the greatest long-term mental health. And the having a strong mental health outlook will make your studying more enjoyable, more productive, and more rewarding. So that's actually the first comment that I have. Both of these situations resonate with me and make me feel as if, wow, you guys are really kind of uh, you know juggling so much, it would be really easy for it to fall through the cracks. So first thing is, is don't feel bad if that does happen. Yeah, I've seen that actually work very much against someone where they think they're doing everything right with the LSAT as their collective world falls apart around them. 
And it's almost impossible to do one in the absence of the other or in the presence of chaos in the other. It's very hard to make strides forward on this test when you feel like you're neglecting your kids or your job or your social life to some degree. Sacrifice is compromise is sure, but nobody can really prep with these situations in a perfect vacuum. No, said. they can't. So let's talk about the practicalities of this. Yeah. And I was just rereading that first note. 39, two businesses as well as a full-time job and three kids. <laughs> That's amazing. Congratulations. <laughs> that is a full platter right there that you are balancing. The way I look at situations like this is that it is really easy to want to binge on studying, like mm -hmm. to try and say, all right, you know, everybody's asleep at this point and I can study for four or five hours deep into the night. I honestly don't think that's the best way to do this. I think it's draining. I don't think you're going to be able to get a whole lot out of it when you're doing this in a fatigued way. And so my preferred method for people who really have a lot is low level consistency. And sometimes people get kind of aggravated with themselves. They're like, well, I want to do two hours a day. You can't do that with these schedules. That's just not a possibility. Right. And then they're like, well, I want to do one hour a day. I'm like, that can be a situation where it's very difficult. So instead, try to break it into these micro pieces, 20 minutes here, 25 minutes here, 30 minutes here. Instead of taking full sections that are going to take 35 minutes and then the review time, tell yourself you're just going to do the first 10 questions of a section. Focus on that. Then later on, you're going to do the next five questions. Break this into bite-sized pieces and make it more digestible. You have a long journey in front of you. The way to do this is to take that first step. If you alternatively are like, I want to do it in big chunks, I'm going to wait till the weekend, you get to the weekend and inevitably your life is going to intervene and all of a sudden you're mad at yourself because you're like, I was going to do eight hours and then I was going to do four hours and I got 40 minutes in. Right. Yeah. I'm going to do a practice test Saturday and a practice test Sunday and they're four. It's just unrealistic. Yeah. And so, you know. Without knowing specifically what materials are being used and, and, and so forth, other than the second case with like right. the online course, yeah, there's a lot of homework in these courses. Don't worry about doing it all at once. Try to do little pieces. And especially kind of like if you're in transit and you're not actually the driver, if you are the driver, you don't get to do this. But if you can grab a book or log into your online student center and kind of say, all right, I want to check this off, but make a realistic schedule and keep it at a low level and don't overpressure yourself because if you do, the whole thing will fall apart. And I've seen this many, many times. Sometimes you have to take a step back to start taking steps forward. Yeah. I love that idea about productive multitasking that you allude to there. See if you can study while you commute. See if you can listen to something in the car as you drive your kids around, like a podcast. Or if, again, you're in one of these courses, you can play the videos back and just listen to the discussion. So there's still a lot that you can do even while occupied with other things. But be realistic and look, sit in, settle in for the long haul. This is the other thing that I always try to remind people is you don't have to sprint to succeed here. It may be that your better move is to just plan on a marathon. Maybe this is going to take me six or eight months when someone else could do it in two or three. Yeah. And as far as the, you know, you mentioned listening to the podcast when you're driving the kids around to soccer or whatever the case might be. Remember that some of the episodes that we get into are really detailed in terms of concepts. Seek those out. You can see online what the list is. You can see when we're talking about things like flaw in the reasoning or how to identify limited solution set games or how to solve parallel reasoning questions. Gravitate towards those more content heavy episodes. We haven't designed this episode to be kind of like a course. That's not what it is. We spend a lot of time talking about current LSAT events, which is a weird phrase to just say in general, <laughs> but current LSAT events. And there's been so many changes in both the LSAT and the world in the last two years that that's actually occupied a lot. And it hopefully it's fun to listen to us talk. I think John and I like listening to ourselves talk. <laughs> but some of these episodes from a studying perspective are going to be worth more than others. So given that your time is at such a premium, gravitate towards those, identify those. And I will say this, John and I make real pains and efforts. We really strive to make this safer work. I wondered if you were going to bring <laughs> that up because if you weren't, I was. We are uncharacteristically clean for this exact scenario. If your kids are in the back seat, you play it. You're fine. You're fine. I think, you know, there's no, we don't swear on this. Uh, every, I think there's maybe one instance of us getting even close to that line. 
Uh, and I'm not sure that that's, uh, you know, that's really an issue. But we actually make a point of not swearing, not really talking about topics that are overly controversial, primarily because we do realize that some people are driving their kids around or they're in an office environment or people might be walking by that they don't know during lunch. So you can actually listen to those without the fear of, I've got to all of a sudden mute these guys. What are they saying? It's a... Uh, really a very cultivated and direct choice on our part to do it that way. Yeah, I think chances are far better we'll put your kids to sleep than <laughs> say something controversial. <laughs> As somebody who struggled with a child who didn't want to go to sleep for years, uh, I wish I guess I should have played her the podcast. Maybe that would have been my magic charm. Yeah, put her on the phone with me. I'm an expert at <laughs> listening to people drift <laughs> off. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next question here. This was also by email. And it said, I had a question about keeping track of what I've done wrong on practice tests. I heard some advice from people to go through the test and write down the number, why I got it wrong, and so forth. I was wondering if this is really worth it. I'm going through the problems I get wrong to understand why I miss them, but I feel as if logging everything is wasting my time. Would love to know if you think this has been helpful for previous students. Double exclamation point. Love the enthusiasm. Absolutely. A great question, too. I love, I love the actual inquiry here. So right, let's tag team it once again. First of all, I mean, the easiest question in this, I wonder if it's worth it. Has this been helpful for previous students? The short answer to that is absolutely yes. No question. The extent to which you need to do it to make it maximally helpful for you, that's where I think the, the nuance here and the interesting part of this comes in. Because some people need to do much more logging and tracking and notation and honestly circling back to past things than others. Others get it right away. It was a careless mistake. So a lot of it, I think, comes down to your comprehension and competence in the moment. And I think that plays into the idea of the level of detail that you use when you're actually making these notations. Some people need to do more or less. I can tell you that my view of this is very strongly that it is beneficial no matter what level you're at. And let's just talk for a moment about people who are shooting for, say, 165 and above. To me, this type of logging is critically important because at the 165 and up level, you're not failing that often. You're more often than not getting things correct. And so this becomes a log of failure. And that may sound like a negative thing, like, oh, it's just what I wanted. It's, you know, this heavy log following me around that just tells me that I failed. No, 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 it's not how I look at it. I've said this many times before, is that failure breeds success. And that if you miss a question, learning from it is one of the most valuable things that you can do while preparing for this test. So it might be a failure log in terms of what you're listing out, but it ultimately becomes the platform for success as you move forward here. And so for me, I have always thought this is one of the most powerful tools. If you take a test, miss a bunch of questions, don't do anything in terms of tracking it. You don't have a way, like our analytic system, you, you will know what you missed, what you got correct. You can flag questions. Or if you have like a paper and pencil system or an Excel spreadsheet, if you don't track this information, you're just throwing away opportunities to learn more. As a teacher, that irritates me. I don't like to see people who are like, oh, well, I could have learned, but I didn't. And they flit on their merry way. For me, being able to go back and say, I missed this question. What was it about this question that was really problematic? Especially at the higher scoring levels, that is gold to you because you're unique and the person next to you might not have missed that question. They might have missed a different question for an entirely different reason that you didn't have a problem with. And so it becomes a very personalized record of your performance, of the problems you had, and that gives you a focal point where you can go in and attack your weaknesses. There is nothing better than that when you're trying to get better. Yeah. You touched on some of the features that our analytics provide. One of them is this exact thing where you can create basically a question bank click by click of questions that you missed or places where you struggled. And we encourage people to do it. And we talked about this idea of like the opportunities inherent in mistakes a couple of episodes back. We also paired it with the notion of cataloging your successes as well. I mentioned keeping like a success journal where every time you sit down to study, write down one, two, three things that you feel you did right or that went well or improvements that you could see. Keep track of both. The mistakes tell you what you can improve on. The successes show you the potential that you have 
once those improvements begin to take hold. Yes, and the more questions that you do, the more practice tests, the more important this becomes. Think about it like working out. Let's say you're just working out and you're kind of going and you do your thing, but you're not really tracking what's happening. You're not necessarily working any specific area. And then all of a sudden, after a few months, you realize, boy, my legs are weak. Well, you really never had leg day and or you skipped it a lot. It's the same thing here. If you're just doing all these different tests and you never really stop to say, what am I missing? You may have weak legs. And in our case, weak legs might be you're bad at flaw and parallel questions. But you don't know it because you're not actually looking at it actively and trying to attack it. That's what this does for you. It keeps a record of progress and failure, and that helps you actually succeed going forward. Yeah, that's perfect. It's really hard to see patterns in isolation, but doing it this way will show you things over a longer time span than just a one instance. There's a ton to be gained from realizing that or studying that. All right. Yeah. Let's go to the next question, which I'll read this one as well. Another email question. Hello. My question is, when do you know if you've reached your LSAT peak? Is there one? After over a year of studying, I feel maxed out and I'm already 20 plus points over my diagnostic score. On practice tests, I went from around a 145 diagnostic to a 168 on practice test 86 before the June test thanks to Adam and Jay. And that would be two of our ACE instructors uh, that we work with. Since then, I've hovered in the 162 to 166 range from March up to June. It was over a year of pretty serious studying with some great tutors. Is it time to call it a day? That is a tougher question, I think, than something (laughs) we've seen so far. Because my instinct, and I know yours as well, is to say, no, keep going. Um, But that's not the right answer for everybody. No. I do think there are ways that you can measure this a little bit. This person talks about feeling maxed out, but there's other factors in play as well. Where are you trying to go to school? What do their medians and numbers look like? How important are scholarships to you? Because another two or three points might not make a difference of getting in, but it might be tens of thousands of dollars. For a lot of people, that's more than enough compulsion to keep studying. Um, To me, I I tend to base it on those two things. What outcomes do you need? And what does the data right now tell you? What do your practice tests look like? What are the most recent things you're doing now or leading up to your next attempt potentially going to look like? That's the best way ultimately to predict what's likely to happen. And I'll mention two other factors that um, I would be interested in seeing. The first is it says a, a year of pretty serious studying. So first off, Kigudos, really, to you for going through a year of studying. I love that. I love to see people really like commit themselves to something and see great progress. I mean, 20 plus points uh, on practice tests is fantastic. You know, mid 140s into the upper 160s, that's solid. You've, you've come a long way. So, first off, congratulations on that. However, I would ask, what did that studying really entail? I'm going to assume that it entailed doing a lot of practice tests and doing the majority of exams that are out there. But that would be my first question uh, in this situation to say, well, did you do 20 practice tests and you just kept looking at those 20? I don't think so, but it's worth asking. Yeah. Or have you done every practice test since 40 all the way up to the present and you did all the games from 1 through 39? So I'd like to know that in, in terms of the evaluation. The second thing I would say is, if you've reached this particular point before June, have you studied since then? All right, that's, that's the, kind of the next thing. We see what's happening all the way before the June test. What's happened since then? Have you taken a break? If you've taken a break, I'm totally fine with that. I've said many times that taking breaks from the LSAT is incredibly important and quite beneficial for most people. Mm-hmm. If you've taken a break, how long has it been? Was it a week? Was it a month? I'm hoping in this situation that it was something serious, like a month, maybe even two months, or you know, the better part of two months. Right. If that's the case, this is what I would then recommend. Go take another test. Go take a practice test after having this long break, and let's see how you score then. Which sounds like, oh, you're just setting that person up for a disaster. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not cruel. Uh, What I'm actually setting them up for is most likely greater success because one of the truisms of this exam is that if you've been studying for a long time, 
if you take a break from the test, you don't get worse. You usually get better. Mm -hmm. And that is because this is a process test. Learning about the LSAT is not about learning facts. It feels like it is with the contrapositive or this flaw, what have you, how to diagram a logic game, but it really isn't. It's about thinking processes, reasoning processes. Process exams do not have a linear response in terms of the amount of time that you study and where your score ends up. Instead, people tend to jump up from plateau to plateau. When you take a break from the test, most people think, I'm going to get rusty. No because your subconscious continues to look at these ideas, move them around, in a lot of cases, creates an architecture to better understand it. And so for a lot of students, when they come back from a break, guess what? They're all of a sudden several points better. So I would like to see how long you've taken a break for, and then hope it's a long period of time, and then say, go take another practice test and see how you do. That might actually unlock a whole new world here where you're like, hey, there is a higher elevation that I can reach. Yeah, and let's not overlook the fact that the test you took in June and the test you studied for for the past year is not the same LSAT as we have now in August and going forward. You could actually see an improvement just from the nature of the new test, a break in the middle between sections two and three. I can make a world of difference for people. S slightly less pressure in the sense that maybe the section that you had struggled on was experimental. Yeah. This, this format can benefit people. That's a, that's a fantastic point there. Yeah. So, I mean, and it speaks right to your advice, which is sit down and take the new type of LSAT and see if how that goes. Or well, see how you feel too. The score, I think, can a lot of times tell you less than the feeling that you get back from it. You may find yourself re-enthusiastic or re-motivated, or you may hate it so much that you answer your own question. Yeah, you may just discover that, hey, I'm not, things aren't clicking for me. To answer the ultimate question, is there a maximum limit for some people? Yes, there is. That's simply the way it works. And now it might be because they have constraints on time, uh, constraints on their ability to study through this, or even to really like the material. Not everybody's going to get a 180. That's certainly the case. So there are maximum limits. The question is, is have you reached yours? We need more information to make that determination. Yeah. But there's some good practical tips to get you some information to at least help yourself. 100%. I'm going to read the last question too. Do it. You're on a roll. Even though you have the more dulcet tones, mm -hmm. I'm going to read this one. Email. Why'd I score so low? I got a 159, 10 points lower than my average for the past 10 plus prep tests. I've studied full-time for eight months, invested in numerous resources, listened to podcasts, read up on forms, meditate, hired a tutor for the final stretch, abstain from alcohol, mistake, work out. <laughs> I just don't get it. Now I'm applied to four T14 schools that my metrics come in below the 25th uh, percentile median, and I am praying my softs carry me through to one of my dream schools. All right, there's a little bit more to this. Mm -hmm. What now do I retake? have a free retake since I'm a first time taker with a fee waiver and how would I approach such a thing also thanks for putting together the podcast I love the format thank you thank you we we love it too <laughs> most of the time there's a lot to unpack here you want to take yes. the first crack at it uh certainly the first thing is I would say a lot of the advice we just gave to the prior person applies here you study full time for 8 months you're clearly well invested in this process. Burnout could be on the horizon, so or we could be in the throes of it. That is one of the possible causes here of the 159. So the second thing that I would say is, and what is perhaps more likely and even concerning to me is, if you had created a track record of prep tests where you had more than 10 that were, say, kind of like at the 170 level, which is about what this is, and then you went out and got a 159 on the real thing, what happened from a test anxiety standpoint? Because usually when we run into this situation where there's all of a sudden a precipitous drop, it has something to do with kind of like maybe freezing a little bit, zoning out, getting a little bit too tense about the whole process. Uh, to me, it is a problem that is almost always at the root cause of somebody having all of a sudden this huge drop, unless the test that you took was simply configured really badly for your skill set. Right. That's the third possible explanation to me, at least. Yeah. And when that happens, it tends not to be mysterious. In other words, it tends not to be followed by a question of what occurred, what happened. People know what happened if they 
couldn't finish a section or couldn't do a game or something, you know, even technical issues that might have screwed them up, they can usually pinpoint more objective things. It's the mentality, the anxiety that's a harder thing to figure for people. And usually that's what leads to a drop that's mysterious like this. Yeah, let me tell you what my litmus test is. It's kind of like the simple litmus test for mm -hmm. students after the test as to whether or not they might be in danger of having a sudden drop in scores. When I talk to students afterwards, if we start, you know, just chatting about it and they say to me, I can't remember anything about the test. This is one of the worst signs to me. This gives me immediate bad feels. Uh, the cautionary flags go up. Good test takers know what they just did on the exam. They remember the questions. Do they have to remember every question? No. But they'll be like, oh, I remember one of the games was about ladders. And one of the reading comprehensions was about pterodactyls. They'll have some recollection. If they see someone else talking about the test and they mention that one of the passages was about pyramids, they'll be like, oh, yeah, that was in my section too. They have some degree of recall, sometimes greater, sometimes lesser. That by itself isn't the problem. The people who worry me the most, you have to ask yourself, uh, you know, emailer, whether or not you qualify as this. Did you walk out of that test and not remember anything? Was it kind of like you were in the blackout zone? It was a black hole that you entered? Some that is state. where yeah. something happened. You froze in that moment. And it doesn't, that's not a bad thing. This, this happens to everybody. It's like walking on stage and all of a sudden you don't remember what the speech is that you plan to give. You can overcome that, but I need to know from a test preparation standpoint whether or not that was the case. <laughs> I can feel a few thousand people who just took August listening to this right now and thinking, I can't remember anything. Dave just told me I'm doomed. That's it's not, not always the case. Some people find themselves in a zone and they operate on autopilot. Um, but you've got to be able to get yourself there and rely on that type of well-trained instinct before uh, the amnesia is not a bad sign. Well, they usually then, if you if they come across a topic, they will say, oh, I do remember that question. Oh, there was a question on speeding. All right, there was a question on frogs. Yeah. Usually you can trigger that recollection. My worst experiences with students who had you know bad anxiety uh, episodes with the test is they just don't recall anything. Mm -hmm. It's all a blur. And if it feels like it's all a blur, that means that you weren't present in the moment. And if you're not present in the moment, you are in trouble on a test like this, which requires so so much focus and concentration every single second. Yeah, it's risky. Um, I don't think it's any great secret to people who know you that you're a very good driver. Um, but it wouldn't worry me for someone as good a driver as you if you arrived someplace, you came to meet me, and I was like, how'd you get here? Or how many lights did you pass? Or did you see that school bus back there? And you said no. Because you can do that on autopilot. You've trained yourself to be good enough. That's a little bit of what we're talking about here. It's usually the people who aren't as well-trained, say, behind the wheel, that when they blank out for a dozen miles or so, we're all in danger. There's that. It's a yeah. good analogy, too, because what you're really saying is if I showed up and you were like, hey, what's going on? And, and I was like, how would I get here? Yeah, where am I? That's what I'm talking about. Was right. just <laughs> that zoned out yeah. entirely. I'm like, Did I drive? I don't even remember doing Degree of this. almost like comatose. Um, yeah. So I, I want people to be able to make that distinction. What we're talking about is truly like, I don't know what even just happened to me. That's worrisome. Yeah. It's like that episode in Limitless, uh, that portion of the Limitless movie where all of a sudden he doesn't remember anything. He just walks 20 blocks and mm -hmm. he doesn't recall that he's done. It. He's like, how did I get 20 blocks here? And now all of a sudden it's like midnight, that kind of situation. If you don't recall anything, it's a concern for us. I thought you were going to talk about the Archer story arc where, uh, He's having like fugue states. One time he's in Bob's Burgers as a crossover thing. <laughs> he doesn't remember. No, nope. that was the movie Limitless, one of my very favorite movies. Because I need some NZT. It's really if you want to like. have a repeat experience with it, it was a book first. I, think it's I know, I have Fields. the book. Yeah, it's good, but it is dark at the end. It ends very differently than the movie. He does not become a senator or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent book, excellent movie. Bradley Cooper, one of my favorite Hollywood stars. And uh, that guy can speak French like a native. Like a Frenchman, yeah. Um, all right. All right, yeah. So I think that mostly sums up the questions we got. All of these overlap to various degrees, but most of the ones that were pretty directly targeted towards prep.
Yeah, and I'm going to add one more comment to our student here now that we've okay. kind of talked about the anxiety. Let's just say that it wasn't, it was a bad test, and now you're sitting there looking to retake. Um, we have a, a blog that I wrote that has six really, I think, useful steps. In fact, I have to update it for the four-section LSAT as opposed to the old five-section LSAT, but it's called, if I recall, uh, what to do when you're retaking the LSAT. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that would help you kind of like structure your approach to kind of going through this. But mostly what I would say to you as a retaker is um, don't study as hard. Take more time off. Do exactly what we did with the prior uh, listener and say step back a little bit. Lower the pressure on yourself. Get a little bit more free space, uh, more personal time. Do, a, do enough to, with the LSAT to keep conversant with it at a low level, but don't push yourself as much. And I bet that once again, that idea of taking one step back to move forward, that would be the key that would unlock that for you. Yeah. I read this as a person who's done more or less everything right up to this point, but probably just put too much pressure on themselves. A retake, like you say, really allows you to capitalize on your experience, the knowledge you've gained with far less intensity and self-judgment. Yeah, this sounds like full-on immersion, and I love that, mm -hmm. but eight months of it full-on immersion, that concerns me because that's an easy way to burn out. Yeah. All right, let's Good move advice. on. Let's move out of the direct LSAT prep sphere, and let's talk a little bit more about applications, the admissions process, and the admissions cycles, and mm -hmm. we'll actually close this segment out when we get to it by talking about uh, how the next cycle looks, mm -hmm. the one that everybody's about to be in or is really starting to be in yeah. at this point. All right. Do you want me to read this first one? Do it. Okay. Um, for no particular reason. I just was going to give you a break. This was another email, and here it goes. It starts very nicely. Thank you for all that you do for exclamation points. Damn. So that's some real enthusiasm. <laughs> Here's the context. I've taken the LSAT three times. Once was February 2018. Canceled it took the flex twice. It's July and October, 156, and then a 161. Solid. This cycle, I was offered a full ride to five law schools and a merit scholarship covering 75% of tuition to a sixth law school. Great results. I decided to defer for a year, so I'm planning on my reapplication process now. And here's where the, the details come in. This student, in writing to us, told us that she was just diagnosed with OCD, parentheses, finally, in November. So after all of her tests, I started therapy for it, prescribed medication to help me manage anxiety, other symptoms. Last week, I took a practice test for the first time since late September to gauge whether I should consider taking it again. I got a 165. So speaking to your benefits of breaks, Dave. I was much less anxious, didn't rush through the test at all. Reviewing my wrong answers was a breeze. The anxiety cloud was lifted. I really, really want to shoot for the June test and a 175. My parents are incredibly supportive of deferring, uh, pay for a private tutor. Should I consider taking the test the fourth time? And then should I write an addendum explaining what was up with having undiagnosed OCD? Uh, this is a great question. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on here, but I think there's actually some simple answers to this. One of the things about accommodations that I find most interesting is that the idea is to level the playing field. And you can see how this person all of a sudden feels like the, the playing field was leveled. And that pressure that they felt previously has been lifted. And it becomes a breeze, really a more normal experience for what a lot of really good test takers feel. So for me, given kind of like the confidence that this is inspired, as well as the instantaneous score jump, as well as the belief that there is even more to come, right. and not just a little bit more, but a lot more room, yes, you should take that test a yeah. fourth time. Don't even hesitate for a moment. Sign up immediately for whatever test you're thinking about and uh, start putting the time back in to prepare. This sounds to me like the exact optimal conditions for you now to achieve your true potential. Yeah, while we're cataloging all of the pros versus cons here, and the pros list is clearly <laughs> winning, let me add one more to it, which is they've deferred for a year with already great results. That gives them plenty of time to study, to use and negotiate some of those scholarship offers from schools going forward into the next cycle. So again, if you're looking at these two columns, this is all signs point to yes. Take it again. Yeah, I think what will ultimately happen is, is you know, you're going to have to go back in and start at ground zero. 
But if you've got a score that all of a sudden is, say, 170 or up, you're probably applying to different schools than you applied to previously. So you'll be able to kind of say, all right, I know I have can ha- have had success at this point. Right. Now, if I add even better credentials, I should have more success. The second part of this is about writing an addendum, explaining what was up with having undiagnosed OCD. People have different feelings about this. Sometimes they don't want to admit that they had an accommodation or that there was something that was taken into account like this. And when someone has a very strong feeling about that, I always respect it. So you don't want to talk about something. I may think that you should, but if you don't want to talk about it, it's too painful, then you shouldn't. You you can't harm yourself in the process of actually applying. I will say this person seems rather open to the idea. And I would actually write uh, an addendum here because if you have a significant score increase after having a cancellation of 156 and and 161, let's say you posted a 175, you've hit a 14 point increase, even more based on earlier scores. As a application reader, my thought is, I wonder what happened there? Took a year off and did that much better. Now, some people would say, well, no, it's bad to admit to a law school that you have OCD. No, this person got therapy for it. They have medication that helps manage the effects of it. You can say, look, this was something I was unaware of where it was affecting my performance and was actually hindering uh, my ability to score at my potential. I took the appropriate steps. It's now well within control and managed, and it's not going to have an effect on my LSAT any longer. You can see I've done really well. It's not going to have an effect on me going to law school. All the boxes are checked. Law school is like, okay, we've got that. No concerns whatsoever. You go in the books as a 175. It changes the game for you, and it will change the scholarships and the schools that you get into. So for me, it's 100% yes across the board. Yeah. The only caveat to the addendum I might add is I don't think you need to write one for, say, a 156, 161, 164, or 165. But if you get the kind of jump that we're talking about, hopefully achieving here, say into the mid 170s, I'm 100% with Dave. Super point right there, because that is exactly the case. If you come in and it looks like a normal score increase pattern, don't talk about it. It's just at 14 points after two prior scores, I'm wondering what happened. So whenever you have that situation in an application where you're like, I wonder, you Mm -hmm. want to have that question answered. Yeah, exactly. Cool. All right. Let me take another one. Since, again, it starts with a compliment. I'm angling for the ones that say nice things about us. Uh, This is another email that we got. This one's about retaking for more money. Starts, love the podcast. One exclamation point. Could have done better there. The knowledge has been extremely beneficial for me. I really appreciate all the effort you put in. It does not go unnoticed. And here comes the question. Do you ever ever (laughs) recommend taking the January LSAT after applying to school solely to raise your score for scholarship purposes? Although I realize this is an LSAT podcast, not a law school admissions podcast. It's both. Is there anything besides GPA that you think law schools look for when deciding who to offer scholarships to? Well, let's take the first part of that question. Yes. Do we recommend taking the January LSAT solely to raise your score for scholarship purposes? Yes. All the time. All the time. Seen it work hundreds, if not thousands of times at this particular point. Uh, 100% Yes. You can use these later LSAT scores to increase your position to get off the wait list, for example, uh, so that, you know, just to get into the school and then to use it for greater leverage. You come in at a 160 and you've been accepted at a school and they've made a certain financial offer. Well, now you come back with a 164. Guess what? You're more attractive. In a sense, it's like you went out and got plastic surgery, improved <laughs> your looks, and now you're coming back and you're like, I, I'll date you still, but we got to up the level here. I was so, thinking maybe they went out and got in better shape, but <laughs> yours works too. It's It can be <laughs> such a quick thing. It yeah. doesn't matter. I'm just joking around as everybody well knows. So the answer to that is 100% yes. We've seen people do this and we do recommend it. I recommend it in the cases where you feel like it's a very high degree of confidence that you will score higher. If you think it's a guess, I'm not as interested in recommending it. This is about, there are points on the table, I know I can get them, and I'm confident that I will go out and do it on this particular exam. Yeah, then go do it. I was reading between the lines of this. The implication seemed to be the January LSAT almost ominously, is that too late? Would you ever suggest someone take a test that late into the cycle? And maybe they didn't mean it that way, but I know a lot of people do. 
So I'll put that to rest if I can as well. I would say this applies to January, February, March, April, really up until the schools stop making decisions about people. You have the opportunity to improve yourself in their eyes. Do it if you can. I've seen people use June to do that. I so, see, yeah, we see people use June this month. I've seen it happen wow. in the past couple of weeks. There's no question about it. Now, the other part of that question is one that um, I find interesting as well. Is there anything besides GPA that you think law schools look for when deciding what to offer scholarships? or who to offer scholarships. Yeah. It, the common thing is, is that it's just GPA and LSAT and the rest of it doesn't matter. That is false. It's largely GPA and LSAT to get in the running. It's kind of like you have to qualify for the Derby. Mm. You first get to the field. It's a big field. There's a whole bunch of people running that race. But you had to get there. And LSAT and GPA really are some of those things that they can use to call the group and say, hey, you're in. In general, it, under consideration, this other group is going to be l probably unlikely. They're still going to look at them, and some of those people will actually turn out to be gems that they're like, we like that person. So they are not knocked out. It's just that this is an easy way to separate people because it is black and white. Mm -hmm. It is a hard number on both counts. But the thing about law school admissions is this. People are going to work with you for three years, and they're going to see you as people, not numbers. And so if they're going to make the choice to admit you, they're going to look past the numbers. We've talked about this in various episodes over the years. Somebody who has killer numbers and who is a complete jerk in their application, they will get sussed out and rejected. I've seen this happen before. Yeah. I've seen people with 180s get rejected from top schools because they're like, they wrote essays that were horrendous and self-centered <laughs> and completely, you know, unself-aware. So yes, it is going to matter. That's when your softs come in. Once, once the numbers get you in the running, your softs are going to make the difference, the quality of your essay and vice versa. If you don't have great numbers, but you have written just a moving, amazing personal statement, that brings you up the ladder. So it goes both ways here. Yeah, it definitely does. We've seen lots of things disqualify people, really snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Uh, sometimes it's legal stuff too. That seems to be a big one where people are like, well, you know, I did spend six years in prison for stealing cars or something. It's like, well, that's going to be tough to explain or overcome. Um, so in the same way that you can do harm to yourself with these things, you can also do yourself a lot of favors. Yeah, especially character issues. Embezzling comes to mind. Right, yeah. Hey, I've got two embezzlement charges on my record. Mm, that's a challenge. That's a character issue. And mm -hmm. you didn't just make one mistake. You did it twice. It's like, ouch, repeat. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Got into a car accident and nobody cares about that uh, unless you, you know, there's extenuating circumstances that make it worse. Yeah. So make yourself as unique, as diverse, as interesting as possible with your softs. And then coupled with good credentials elsewhere, I think you've got a good shot anywhere, frankly. It's the best you can do. Let's move on. All right. I'll take this one, John, since it's written to me. Yes, it is. Hey, Dave, exclamation point. Here's a question for you. I've been drafting my personal statement, and I was wondering how personal is too personal for the personal statement? This came on Twitter, I and I actually responded to the person, and I, I can't remember exactly what I wrote, but it was something to the effect of, uh, there's nothing that's off the table on this. And I truly believe that. I've seen people write about every single topic under the sun, um, being an atheist, I've seen people write about abortion, uh, all sorts of religious topics that have come in, personal rights, um, LGBTQ plus kind of statements, gun rights. I've seen every topic under the sun, some of them extremely personal and painful, um, and others not so much. But my belief is this, it's less about the topic and more about the execution. Yeah. If you write about something personal, it can be a fantastic essay if handled correctly. If you write about something personal and you kind of like don't handle it well, then it's not going to be compelling. So there is very few things that you would say, gosh, don't write about that. I, I can think I could probably work with someone and say, no matter what their topic was, if they were like, this is what I want to write about, no matter how personal it was, we could make it into a great essay because it's about the execution of the writing and presentation. So to me, nothing's off the table, but what's more important is how well you get it done. Yeah, I agree with that. 98%. What? The 2% two, the two is a small little window into my mind where I can actually think of a few things that you would not want to write about no matter how well presented or executed. 
I you don't want to get into know. conspiracy theories. You don't want to start talking about. Don't make yourself sound like a lunatic. Elvis is my dad, and we're you know we live in Kentucky. Just sound normal, but you can talk personally. In fact, I think oftentimes the more personal, the more revealing you can be, without it turning in again into craziness. Then okay. the better. Yeah, you you're right. I should have uh, put a disclaimer in front of my answer that says, assuming that you're not talking about <laughs> something wild or and or criminal. Yeah, yeah. Because I can the, think yeah. of some. It's too personal to say where the bodies are buried. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll grant you your caveat there. Thanks, buddy. I'm still right, though. But anyway. You are right. <laughs> Let's move on. Okay. I think there's two questions that we could probably tackle more or less simultaneously here. Uh, and I know at least one of them came into you on Twitter as well. Mm -hmm. So do you want to take a stab at this, at least in reading it? Certainly. Okay. And this is the Twitter question. Okay. I understand schools prefer academic sources for a letter of recommendation, but having been in an online Zoom class since my sophomore year of college, I would have to go back to early undergrad days to find a professor who knew me well. Should I write an addendum? Would advisors work? Any guidance? Thank you. And then the second question, which came in via email, was, I was wondering about your opinions regarding letters of recommendation that were written by a TA and co-signed by a professor. That's unusual to me. Mm -hmm. So here we are talking about letters of recommendation. And let's talk about the former case, because I'm sympathetic to this. You've been in online Zoom classes since you're a sophomore, and obviously you're probably about to go through some more um, this year. So what I would probably look at is, is there any possible personal connection here from the early days that is strong enough and has persisted. They really want to see some type of academic recommendation. And you certainly could write a separate statement that says, this has been my situation. I've unfortunately uh, not had many opportunities in that sphere. But what you're looking for is somebody related to the academic field. So if it has to be an advisor, then have it be an advisor. But it would be preferable if it was a TA or a professor or somebody who could say, I saw the academic work of this person and I liked it. And they don't have to be your best friend. They just have to be able to speak with some authority about your ability. And they have to be willing to do so. You can't force anyone to write a good recommendation. You need people who are like, yeah, I'd love to help you out. Also, to those of you listening who are not in the midst of the application process, this should be a flag to you that says, start making relationships, even if they are over email or Zoom or what have you. This will pay dividends down the road. John, probably one of the lessons that I wish I had learned earlier, it's not even probably, is I wish I would have better understood the value of relationships when I was younger. Yeah. Are you speaking and, like specifically academic or just in general? Any. Yeah. The, uh, you know, I've got really one great friend from high school and the rest of the people I went to high school with, I'm like, mm, whatever. And I wish that I'd spent more time investing in those relationships. Now, at least I have a friend from high school still, so we've got that going for me. But it's that kind of thing. People and their relationships, you don't have to make those relationships to get value from them. They tend to transmit value to you as you go forward in life because of opportunities, connections, and things like this, where you help somebody later on, they help you. So for those of you who are still a year or two away from applying, cultivate those relationships, work on them. They will pay dividends even if the value of it is not immediately apparent to you. Yeah, you and I have always been very similar in this. Um, the fact that people have high school reunions and actually go to them blows my mind. Okay. My college friends are still in touch with each other and that's crazy to me. Like guys, we graduated, move on. Same. Right. I know, exactly. <laughs> However, at least in this sense, there's such an immediate an obvious reward to trying to cultivate and nurture these relationships with professors, as you say, that even if you don't care about the friendship itself, just quantify it, quantify the value of what they can do for you. Become a bit more mercenary. See, here I am talking about the human value Yours of relationships. Yours you just definitely immediately sweeter. turn it into a numbers game. That's great. <laughs> well, I just don't know that the human nature of it would <laughs> motivate me enough. Let, uh, me, let well. me add one comment to this too, since we're talking about letters of rec. 
Uh, I know there's also going to be people listening to this right now who are thinking to themselves, well, I'm 15 years out of college. I don't even know if my professors would remember me. I don't even know if they're still employed. Those people, I don't want them to get too hung up on this idea that it's academic or death, basically doom. Because you can get letters of rec from colleagues, coworkers, um, bosses, perhaps. There are ways to still do this that don't have to be academic. But if you have access to the academic pipeline, basically, then I encourage you to exploit that in every way you can. Yeah, I would agree with uh, that sentiment here. Let's let's take a look at the second part of this. Was yeah. opinion regarding those written by TAs and co-signed by a professor. I find that interesting. I mm. have to kind of see that in action. I don't know that I've encountered that frequently before. This kind of like the is an analogy to me of who would you rather have the governor mm. write you a letter of recommendation who doesn't know you or your manager at McDonald's. Um, I want the manager at McDonald's because that person's going to know me. And I'm not saying that TAs are managers at McDonald's. Um, there's nothing wrong with either. What I'm saying is, is that from a power dynamic, the professor looks to be so much more powerful like the governor and the TA doesn't look as powerful. But the TA probably knows your work. And they are typically graduate students uh, who would be able to talk about this. There's nothing wrong with that. If the professor is going to co-sign in, I'm still kind of like, huh, how does that actually play out? Are they going to add comments or are they just like, yes, I agree with everything the TA said? I don't even know if the professor is kind of like required here. Right. But a TA, junior professors, yeah, you don't need the name brand. What you need is someone who knows you. I did a, a webinar a while ago that I think we have posted online about letters of recommendation, mm -hmm. and I covered scenarios like this. And anybody wondering about letters of rec, go check that out, because I think it's super useful. And I covered a lot of scenarios about how to get letters, um, how to work with recommenders to produce the best outcomes, and literally who you could choose and why you would choose them. So that's all in there. This covers it just a little bit. But uh, I think this would be fine overall, though I'd like to see how the co-signing works. Yeah, I'd want to see what it looked like at the bottom, basically. All right, let's move on from letters of rec. Let's move on to an area where we talk a little bit about school choice. Okay. And John, if you don't mind, I'm going to take these to read. Go for it. In part because I got an interesting message from one of our former students in the midst of it that actually answers the questions almost perfectly. Yeah, you so forwarded that to me. I'm looking forward to a discussion of it because it's fantastic. Yeah. Bringing back an old name from the past, our friend Marvin, who's uh, already turning into a major success as we thought. So here is the opening question. Hey, Dave, just wanted to ask for the podcast. Is it better to go to a top 20 school and incur $150,000 or more in debt or go to a top 50 school with no debt? So that's an interesting question by itself right out of the gate. So if you were to just look at that on the surface, there are a lot of questions there that could go either way. Um, how much more than $150,000 in debt is one of them? Uh, what are your career goals? How do you feel about being in debt? A top 50 school with no debt is not bad. And in a lot of cases, that would be perhaps the better choice. But there are certain situations where you might say that the top 20 school is better. For example, you want to become a law professor or you really want to go into the judiciary. Those kinds of things, the top 20 starts to make a bigger difference. Or if money is less of a concern, uh, your parents will help you, these kinds of things. So right there, there's not a direct answer that just says it's yes or no. It's going to be dependent for each person. This person continues on though. I have also talked to a federal judge who is willing to help me out with a clerkship after school. Okay, so somebody gave this guy a printing press with a golden ticket machine inside of it and printed out the golden ticket. Federal clerkships are like the elite level of jobs that you can have when you get out of law school. And so for a federal judge to say, yeah, I'm gonna help you out. My first question would be, how much? Are they just right. offering you the job? Because if they're offering you the job and they don't care where you went to school, go to the top 50 school and avoid debt. I'm all about no debt when you can actually make that happen. So in a situation like that, this person is really in the catbird seat. School choices are there, federal judges floating around with a little pat on the back. I mean, talk about connections. That's exactly the type of connection. We talk about friends you want to make. 
you want to make yeah. friends in the judiciary. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a big deal. But again, part of it depends on more detail than we have here. Is this person going to give you a job or just give you five minutes of their advice over a phone call? Yeah. Build a good connection to have and some time to, as you said, cultivate and nurture it. Let's go to the next question and then we'll talk a little bit about the response here. The next question came in on our forum and it's, I think, a very interesting question. It says, I hear from some people that if one doesn't go to a law school in the top 14, then they are regionally bound in terms of potential employment. Is this true? I really don't want to be regionally bound anywhere, but I'm not confident on my LSAT scores to get me into a T14 school and feel c comfortable with the accompanying loans, meaning if they could get into the T14, they would expect to have a heavy debt load. This concern is especially acute given the LSAT bubble that the scores are currently in. All legitimate. The first thing I want to say is that we uh, have an article on our blog about uh, prestige versus scholarship. Mm -hmm. Basically, is it better to go to the, the better prestige school or is it better to get greater scholarships and go to a lower rank school where the debt is lower? We turn that into a podcast. That is episode five. So I have talked and John has talked about all sorts of scenarios around this decision and given specific ones where people were choosing like number 75 versus number 25, or they were choosing number 30 for, with a free ride versus the number 10 school. So we've gone through this. And you can see both these questions revolve around this, although the person with the federal clerkship, obviously, <laughs> their dynamic has changed. The calculus is different. Yeah, However, can I just interject a compliment here? If anyone wants to know why Dave and I both deserve these drinks, but Dave in particular, <laughs> go look at the comment thread on that scholarship versus prestige blog. And I mean, hey, Dave, compliments. It's epic, man. It's I, I don't know how many Hundreds. people ask me these long, involved questions, and then I enjoy reading them, and then I'm like, well, this is what I think. So then I tell them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a book in and of itself. Go read the comment thread on that blog. It's in just insane. It really could be like a mini novel. Mm -hmm. So interestingly enough, around the time these questions came in, and this was obviously the last few days, one of our former students, a guy named Marvin, Marvin Dyke, I'll name check him here. He's a high quality guy who is down in Texas. And he and I had, um, he'd asked me some questions on Twitter and I'd started helping him. And then we basically became friends and would talk about all sorts of different things. And it was certainly one of the most enjoyable students that I have worked with in terms of kind of like helping them get into law school. And he, he wrote me, he, and he is in law school at this point. He's starting his first day of 2L. And so his message says, first day of 2L started this week. Crazy how fast this stuff goes. Another thing, just this, he just said this out of the blue. I didn't even ask him. He just wrote me this. The school you go to matters. You can be in the top half of your class at UT and still go big law or get a great job. No such luxury at a school like the University of Houston. You've got to be in the top 20% at a minimum. And there's literally tens of thousands of dollars at stake for summer associate positions and then hundreds of thousands of dollars at stake for full-time associates. Having been through it and seen it firsthand, my advice is go to the best school you can. Get the best LSAT score you can. The extra three to six months of studying to retake, the extra money to get a good study program like PowerScore, the money spent for application counseling is all worth it. The upfront pay takes care of itself literally within a year or two. You don't even have to wait to graduate to get a return on your investment. And I love that because he was just telling me his thoughts, which he often did. In fact, he, over the years, had given me so many thoughts. I was like, Marvin, you need to put this into some blog posts for us. And he did. So if you go to our blog and just type in Marvin, he's got several awesome posts on how to study. Yeah. Uh, I'd always get excited I, when I saw one of his posts go up. They're great. They're great posts. People love them. And I had said to him a long time ago, I was like, Marvin, I'll tell you something. If you want to go out and bet on people. I would bet on you in a minute. You're going to be a success. And he's already gotten a killer summer associate position for this past summer, doing exceptionally well. So when he talks, I'm always like all ears. But I love that this came in. I was like, I'm going to actually just pull that comment and use it uh, in relation to these two questions. And so as you look at it, he's really giving you kind of like the push that it does matter where you go. And if you can swing it, going to the better school is usually worth a little bit of debt. The question is, is how much? And that's where it becomes harder to actually tell. 
And what are your ambitions? Not everybody wants to go into big law or federal clerkships or even travel. Um, they just might want to stay regional or local. Do something exactly. you know, smaller time. So all of these are factors. All their I happily they're factors we covered back in that episode and that blog post. Yeah, he really sum summarized a lot of how I feel about this. Me it's too. like, this is what LSAT prep is and studying time. It's an investment in your future and there is a direct payoff in scholarships and the school that you get into and the school you get into pays off in terms of the job you get into, which then pays off in salary. Yeah, it's immediate and continual how it begins to pay you back straight away. So yeah, good old Marvin coming through in the clutch per usual. Thanks, Marvin. Like that, dude. As Thanks, always, Marvin. appreciated. Like I said, I wish I could bet on you, uh, you bet on people and success in life because that guy worked hard. He was relentless. He didn't, you know, his success didn't come because it was handed to him. He worked hard and he deserves every bit of it. Yeah. I think the hardest thing you find in that is just finding someone to take the opposite position. Yeah. You couldn't. Next question. All right. More Twitter. You want it or me? I just did a bunch of reading. You do it. Seems fair. Uh, Twitter question. What are the pros and cons to early decision admissions programs? How significant are those during this upcoming cycle? And there was a little bit more context given here. This was a URM, non-traditional, hopefully splitter, they say, uh, presumably high LSAT and lower GPA. Located in Austin, Texas, with a family, applying to UT as a top school, taking the October test, but continuing or considering pushing to November to focus on the higher score. And here's where the early decision concerns come in. If I drop October, I'll not be able to apply for early decision. I'd love to hear discussion around general pros and cons of these programs. Your thoughts on my situation for consideration of submitting versus waiting. Thank you. Excellent. Love this type of question because mm -hmm. it gives us the opportunity to look at a lot of different interesting features that are out here. So let's, let's go ahead and address the broader question, early decision. Early decision is one of those things where initially it looks like there's no, you know, if you know where you want to go to school and you lock in at an early decision program, well, you're gold. You get in and then everything's taken care of early in the process. You don't have to think about it anymore. You know which school you're going to. And those things are all true. Uh, if you're a person f for whom money is not an object and you have a number one school and you can apply ED to them, uh, there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, even if they don't let you in early decision, the fact that you showed that commitment will come back and actually be a positive on your application moving forward. If you get into the regular decision round and they're looking to, to admit you or somebody else and you've got early decision, they're like, we know this person is going to go here. They are committed and yield matters. We certainly saw that this past cycle where schools were, I don't know how else to put it, begging students to tell them that they would go for sure to their school. I saw all sorts of top 14 schools such as Virginia, Georgetown, what have you, begging to know that they were top choice. I thought it was a little over the top. Yeah, Even though I thought you saw that happen to one of my tutoring students where she was given basically a conditional acceptance to Harvard. And the condition was, after she'd done a face-to-face -face or video interview, the condition was, but if you don't say yes in the next 24 hours, we're taking it back. <laughs> they gave her one day to decide. She called me in an absolute panic uh, that turned into elation when we agreed it was the right thing to do. Yeah, and it's interesting that, you know, they were worried about yield and worried mm -hmm. about rankings. So we understand that. And so, you know, looking at the kind of like the early decision, it rides with your application. It remains a positive even if they don't accept you and they knock you down to regular decision. So on that front, it is a positive. However, there is a really kind of like big negative in this. If you go early decision and they accept you, you're done as far as negotiation, as far as playing schools against each other. And so if money is an object here, this can be a little bit of an issue. This is a person who already has an interesting background being a URM and non-traditional. You're located in Austin and UT is your top school. UT is going to see where you're living and be like, this is a person who is most likely going to be wanting to go here. So they're going to do the math and think to themselves, this is probably a pretty good candidate to, to go to UT if we accept them. So then it becomes about the money. What's more important, to get in and not care about what you're paying because you may pay full ride and you won't be able to negotiate right. that, 
Or is it better to say, I'll take a little bit less of a positive, less of a guarantee almost, and be still able to play UT against whatever other schools that I get into in terms of scholarships? And I say that because scholarship negotiation is now standard. And I call it scholarship renegotiation or negotiation. The appropriate term is reconsideration. Because law schools don't negotiate. They just reconsider their position and then make a decision. I'm like, okay, guys, whatever. Take your special terminology that doesn't make you look as kind of like nakedly bureaucratic and corporate uh, as you actually are. That's fine. That's good. We can all play that game. Sure. So where, where I find this interesting, too, is it also commits you to a certain timeline that might not be in your best interest, particularly score-wise. Look, if you drop October for a score in November that's four, five, six, eight points higher, entirely realistic, then suddenly missing the October deadlines to take that later test was absolutely the right decision. You can have a better chance of getting in with that higher score than you would have earlier. And you've also now got the power to negotiate, as Dave just mentioned. So I, I'm, early decision worries me, man, unless someone is perfectly credentialed and knows exactly what they want to do and is willing to pay the full sticker. Yeah, and now you've moved into the second part of this question, which I think is very much relevant mm -hmm. because what is said here is if you drop October, my view is always the same. When it comes to October versus November LSATs, take the one that will get you the higher score. If you can take November and score one point higher, it is worth it. This is not just me saying this. Um, Spivey and I have done podcasts before, and, and he's clearly uh, a very high profile in the admissions side of consulting for law schools. And he said the same thing. I've heard law school deans say this, usually off the record, because they don't want to get quoted <laughs> saying something like that publicly. Right. And it's the kind of thing where it's like, if you're dropping October for a reason, in meaning that you think you can do better in November, I'd take the higher score. Scores will get you in. ED will not get you in by itself. That's the difference. So in this case, I would probably say, given everything, uh, if you're going to drop October, don't worry about it. Go November and uh, let it ride. Yeah, I agree with you 100% there. All 100. All right. John, I'll let you read the next one too because it's got your name on it. It does. Uh, it's also just a bag of mixed emotions, as we'll see. When I read through <laughs> this thing, it was some highs and lows. Uh, it starts off, hi, Dave and John. I just started listening to your podcast this week, and I am hooked. Thank you. Welcome Start to the addiction. Welcome. I started with a couple of the newest ones. Now I'm going back to your oldest ones and working my way up. Uh, I like this part. Your voices are oddly satisfying, by the way. Ha ha. John's especially. Okay. <laughs> I just turned 30. I'm a first-generation Mexican-American college graduate from San Diego and a court employee. I'm currently studying for the test. So early days yet. And it gives a little context here. So to give you some context for my question, I have to say what worries me about law school, my ability to do well on a graduate level, is I only have a bachelor's degree with a 3.5 GPA. Are there any resources about first-generation college undergrads, law school experiences, success stories of these types of students who received maybe scholarships to top-ranked schools? It would help me with motivation, keep the negative thoughts at bay. And then it ends on a high note, too. I really appreciate the hours you both put into the podcast. I can't wait to hear them all eventually. Hmm. Keep killing it out there, being LSAT wizards. <laughs> Again, I thought it was sweet. But it's really the middle part of this where we get into uh, the question, which is, with this undergraduate experience, there seems to be a, a real looming sense of self-doubt from this person. And that's really yeah. where the question is. Do, do people like this ultimately succeed or... Is this person correct, maybe, in the fears that are brewing? Well, first off, you know, this is a natural concern that a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. It feels as if, you know, law school and especially the better schools, everybody's super smart. But all you're seeing is their outside. You don't see their inside. You don't see what they're thinking and the doubts that they have in their own minds. And trust me, almost everybody has doubts. I don't think you do, John, but most everybody. <laughs> I doubt I would there. finish law school. <laughs> it's the lack of caring, <laughs> uh, not a lack of ability. No, there you go. So one of the things is, is this feeling is natural. And, and there's actually a whole set of discussions around it called imposter syndrome, where mm -hmm. people get into situations where they're like, I don't deserve to be succeeding like this. 
law schools, when they choose you, they looked at your record and they saw all these positives and they said, we think that you can succeed. And one of the things I noticed in here is it's like, I only have a bachelor's degree with a 3.5 GPA. By the way, San Diego State, shout out to the Aztecs, a team I just really peripherally follow and like for some reason. I'm weird that way. So when you look at this kind of like, I only have a bachelor's degree with 3.5, what's wrong with that? Why is that bad? I don't see that that's something to actually apologize for. If you want to know the real truth, your GPA is higher than mine. And, you know, I know the reasons why my GPA isn't 3.5, and a lot of it had to do with beer <laughs> and other things, but I'm not apologizing for my GPA. I'm laughing about it at times. Yeah. It's, it's, college is one of those things where GPA can be really reflective sometimes and not reflective at other times. And so I don't think when someone says, I have a 3.5, that that's a poor GPA. I don't think that makes you unqualified for law school. And there's going to be plenty of people who have very similar GPAs to yours. And some will be higher and some will be lower. And your LSAT score, it could be higher or lower than other people around you. They're not taking a GPA. They're taking a person. And each of us have our own particular skills and abilities. I will tell you this, when you walk into law school on the first day, nobody knows anything. They may think they do, <laughs> but most people are way out of their depth and they discover very quickly that it is a form of learning and a huge codified structure that they have to absorb. Everybody feels like they're on the back pedal and trying to figure out what's going on. You will not be the only one. So I don't know if that helps with motivation and keeping negative thoughts at bay, but I don't see anything in what you've written here that would make me doubt for a minute that you could do well in school. I actually reread this one because I thought I had Mis misunderstood it or misinterpreted it. It seemed to be setting up because, you know, I have an undergraduate degree or I never finished college or my GPA is 1.6. A 3.5 GPA from a good undergraduate institution tells me, if anything, you've got every opportunity to succeed here. I'd be far more surprised if you couldn't. And I want to emphasize a point that you started with here, Dave, because this is a really valuable thing for people to realize. Those most informed who predict how you're going to do in law school are the very people looking at you to let you in. If they say yes to you, that is a tremendous endorsement of your potential. So as soon as you start to hear yes from schools, know what it means. It means they believe in you. You should absolutely trust them and certainly believe in yourself. Yeah, I think the kind of like the secondary part of this that's creating doubt in this person's mind is talking about first generation college undergrads mm -hmm. and law school, meaning there, there's nobody who blazed the trail for them in their family who's done this. It's not a normal part. This person is actually the one who is stepping out and doing it. That is something to be celebrated, not to be concerned about. You're already breaking ground in your family, and I think that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Here's the good news. There are tons of first-generation students, both college and law school, that are out there. And so you will not be alone even in your own class. And there's actually a lot of discussion online. If you start looking up first-generation law student, you will begin to see that there's plenty of people who have posted their opinions and talked about it. A lot of schools actually have resources for students who are first generation or non-traditional or returning to school after some type of break uh, or who need other type of assistance. And so there are kind of like learning centers and so forth. There's usually somebody at the law school that specializes in this that you can go talk to very early on uh, in that orientation process. And it's the type of question you should ask about schools. What will you do to kind of like help support me and guarantee my success? This is not an abnormal situation at all. I have helped hundreds of people get into law school who had never um, you know, gone to a graduate school in their family or even gone to college in their family. So you should have every confidence that you can compete with everyone else in there. And trust me, there's a bunch of other people who will be feeling exactly the same way that you will be feeling on that first day. Yeah, that's well said and a great point. The final point I'll make is actually one of the things you mentioned because I'm going to do a very quick product plug. The people that I hear from who've taken our 1LA course are just about the only ones who consistently don't feel entirely upside down that first day, that first week, that month of law school. They've been given basically the tools to anticipate exactly what they're going to go through and also the tools to best deal with it. Some very actionable things that can help them adjust faster than their peers. So I love that course for what it gives people because 
Otherwise, you are playing with fire your first, again, day, week, month of school. This helps to quench the flames a bit. Yeah, and I should probably at least clarify what the 1LA course does. It's kind of like a law school preparatory course, where in the same way we, John and I, tend to focus on preparing people for the LSAT and helping them improve their scores. The 1LA course is one where we went out and we talked to a bunch of professors across the country, uh, some really high profile names, who were able to talk about their subjects, like constitutional law. And what they do in there is they talk about what you need to know. They kind of give you that overview kind of outline breakdown of here's here's what you're going to see in a class. This is what your professor is going to be talking about. This is the kind of thing they're going to be driving at. These are the points you need to understand. You might be looking over here to the left, but really the professor wants you to be looking to the right and they're going to kind of like work on you to get you to see that particular viewpoint. There's modules about uh, you know legal writing and the best way to study, all sorts of tips that kind of go through the idea of how would you be set up for success in law school. Well, the best way would be to know a little bit about what you're about to get yourself into before you actually walk into that first day. So that's a resource that uh, you might want to think about availing yourself of. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Last question. As promised, you mentioned we were going to talk about this and we have arrived. Let's talk about this upcoming. long episode, I I know. I know. It feels 10 times longer given what you and I have already (laughs) gone through. (laughs) It's been a long day for me. Yep. Uh, there's not enough espresso martini in the world. Let's talk about a question that I saw on Reddit. Actually, someone sent me a direct message on Reddit, which said this, do you believe that the next cycle will be as hard as the current one? And then shout out to Spivey. I know Spivey mentioned something about it, uh, easing very slightly next cycle. Now we get to make some predictions. Well, this is interesting because, um, as a lot of people know, Mike Spivey is a good friend of mine, and um, he and I talk a lot about this. And in fact, we went on record in a joint podcast. We did it on his channel and talked about the upcoming cycle. And uh, we pulled in Justin Kane, who is his data analytics guy, and the three of us kind of had a roundtable discussion about how the next cycle would look. And I will kind of use a quote off that to you know kind of paraphrase. The current cycle, or at least the last cycle, yeah the one that has just ended here in the middle of 2021, so it was the 2020-2021 cycle, was the worst on record. This is the worst cycle that any of us recall. Mike and I have a lot of years of experience doing this, and neither one of us can recall a worse cycle. And there were so many reasons why that's the case. In fact, John and I, in an episode a while back, talked about why is this cycle so tough and so competitive? And so if if you're interested why this really hell zone existed over the last year, go back and listen to that episode because we went into detail and talked about all the bad things that caused this. So in the podcast that Spivey and I did, we actually said, what do you think? If five is a normal cycle and really what we saw in years prior for, for a good number of years, and then this last cycle was 10. What do you think this upcoming cycle will be? Mike's estimate was 8.5. My estimate was, I hope it's eight. Could be worse, but I hope it's eight. Since then, I'm more of the opinion it's probably 8.5 or nine. It was going to go nine. <laughs> I don't like saying that. So I'm not laughing out of like some enjoyment of it. I'm laughing because I was wrong even though it was relatively early. Some of the things I'm seeing with LSAT scoring, uh, the holdover of the bubble, some of the things I'm seeing with deferrals, the way law Mm. schools have incentivized people who were applying to push into next year, which will eat up seats. uh, All those kind of factors have made me start to be concerned. Do I think it's going to be a 10 in terms of difficulty? I hope not. But I don't think it's going to be the halcyon days of old where it's like not that much competition and, you know, a lot of acceptances quickly. I think this is going to be a slow cycle that takes a while. And it's going to be a situation where people who would have thought to themselves, I'll have it all wrapped up in November and December. They're going to be sitting there January, February, March with it without an answer. It's what we just saw, what we just went through. And I think schools are going to be extremely cautious. So it's going to be competitive and cautious. Yeah, that sounds probably like bad news to a lot of people. Let me try to put a brighter spin on it. First, we didn't say 11. In other words, if you've weathered the storm up to this point, if you're familiar with how this last cycle's gone and you're still standing, scarred but standing, it means things should get a little better for you. 
we certainly don't think it's going to get worse. Uh, and I think you'd agree with that, right, Dave? Yeah, the amp doesn't go to 11 on this. No. <laughs> Good reference. Uh, the second thing is knowing some degree with confidence what it's probably going to look like. A slow cycle, inflated medians with GPA and LSAT, better scores, more people applying. All of these inform the decisions you need to make for yourself to be as competitive an applicant as you can be. It's part of why you can take a later LSAT or a higher score. There's not this rush to get apps in early. But it also means you better get as high a score as you can. All of the softs that we talked about before, writing the best personal statement, having letters of recommendation, padding your overall picture with the types of extracurriculars that you might want to demonstrate, all of that becomes so much more important now. So it just tells you where to invest your time and where to focus. I think that's a good thing, ultimately. It does. And one of the things about that caution echoes a point that you're making, which is if schools are going to take their time making decisions, do you have to be the first person in line? No, you don't have to apply in the first week of the window. Uh, people get in not because they're the first in line, but because they were the best in line. And so as you go through this and you look at that, well, I can't take October, as we saw in one of the earlier questions. It's okay to take November. It may be fine to take January and so on and get to later you know, tests because the point is to look as good as possible when you show up. In prior podcasts and other podcasts, I've analogized this to showing up for a date. You show up an hour or two early and you're not ready to go, it's not a good look. You show up on time and you look you know, disheveled, that's not so great. Better to be a little late and show up looking sharp. Story of my life. Up. <laughs> Isn't it though? A little late. You always make an entrance, John. I give you 100% credit to that. It's funny. Yeah. Uh, this is a perfect point. Put your I maybe want to leave the building when you show up, but that's a whole other different thing. <laughs> no, that's fair. Put your best foot forward, even if that first step comes a little bit later in the cycle than is, is normal, because normal has changed. Yeah, there isn't normal right now. And if schools are going to be cautious, there are schools out there that we think, such as Duke, that got themselves probably into a degree of trouble with the rankings because they made so many early admits and they acted like business was usual. They're not going to make that same mistake twice. And so they'll probably be a lot slower. They scrapped some of the programs that led to those early admits and they're going to really watch things carefully. So you show up a little bit later in the process in terms of traditional timelines. It won't be later this time. You don't need to be applying instantly when the window opens. Wait to apply until you can apply with the best foot forward, as you said, John. Yeah, that's perfect advice. So uh, I hope we didn't end on a gloomy note for too many people there. Uh, I still see a lot of positives in what we just said. So do I. In fact, knowledge is power here because yeah. if someone else rushes themselves into line and be like, I've got to be first, they're, they're operating on old knowledge. I'm like, good, your problem, not ours. That means the students that we're working with, the people that we're talking to, you've got more knowledge. You can be more confident. You can make the right decisions to actually look as good as possible when the time comes. Perfect. There you go. And, and we're done. And we're out. <laughs> I think I don't really have any sum, you know, summation points. I think this really actually covers. Like I said, it's a long episode. Any final words from you? I enjoy these, and I know you do too. So the last thing I'll mention is just an encouragement to listeners out there: keep sending us questions. You guys really do supply a lot of interesting talking points. Keep it up. We love hearing from you, especially if you put some of the compliments we were able to read here. It really sweetens the pot. <laughs> Self-serving. <laughs> I didn't see that coming, but I like it. All right. If you get a chance, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you may find it in the world. And if you've enjoyed it, leave us a comment and a rating as well. And if you have those questions that John was mentioning where you talk about how great we are, you can send those to LSATpodcast at powerscore.com. On behalf of John and myself, we hope you've enjoyed it. We certainly have. Have a great week and stay safe. 